I'm just so excited right now to talk about Gundam 00. It's by far my favorite Gundam. And disclaimer, I've seen Iron-Blooded Orphans, the original Mobile Suit Gundam, some of Zeta, and that's kind of it. So I'm not like a Gundam expert, but I'm definitely of the opinion that every proletariat should have a Gundam. Like that's just plain and simple. And so far, Double O is the one that most agrees with that statement. It's by far the most revolutionary one I've seen, and it's it's perfect. As we'll get into it, uh, Lennon himself makes a cameo, and at least a parallel version of himself. There's so much to analyze here, and because this is unscripted, I'm not going to be able to get to it all, but I just want to get a basic review out of the way, no spoilers, and then we'll get into like the real meat, where hopefully I've already sold you on the show if you want to go watch it. Most Gundam shows are set on timelines far ahead in the future and in a completely different material condition than the world we inhabit. But what makes Gundam 00 so special in my mind is this is the only one in the Anno Domini timeline, like the AD timeline. This is only set like a few centuries in the future. All the conflicts in this world just mirror like the current state of conflict. Like the main character Setsuna F. Sei grew up as like a child terrorist soldier. And it's reminiscent of like the Kurdish conflict. Um, you know, it's not one to one, it's completely made up, but like, their movement is completely crushed by another state's force, so their independence is destroyed. It's, it's obliterated. And, yeah, child terrorists motivated by religious causes, this is insane. But yeah, the conflict is the most heated in, of course, the Middle East and other countries like this. And the reason this is, is in this world, oil has been completely made obsolete, which the Middle Eastern economies were based on. Now, one comment is, of course, like, oil is still used to make plastics and stuff, so, like, does this even make sense? No, not really, but in this world, they don't have any access to the solar elevators, which are the new form of energy. And it makes perfect sense, like, uh, economic warfare is a real thing, and it's being used here against these countries. We need to talk about Iolia Schenberg right away, though, because this is this universe's version of Lenin, and they're not exactly the same. In fact, his name Schenberg is from... I believe this guy called Mario Schenberg, a Brazilian communist, like he was actually a scientist who studied quantum stuff, I'm not really, I don't really know who he is, but he was in like a Brazilian communist party, so this guy is clearly, clearly Lenin, um, even his backstory is he was like exiled, but you know, he's more into the scientific aspect than the socialist aspect in this universe. He is the one who put forward the theories of the space elevator, so he transitioned the world into this new form of energy. But he saw the contradictions that would make in um, actual monopolies. So he predicted the next stage. And now he's going to have to deal with this. He invented another plan. He's completely like predicted the flow of history for like the next like five centuries, it seems like at this point. And there's a lot of mystery behind this because we don't know who this guy really is. And it was just so fascinating to watch. I'm like, oh my god, this is Lenin. And, <laughs> and like this weird universe where he's beyond just like having a revolution in one country he's having like this uh he's like concerned with the dialogues in space like what is this so in the first episode he introduces to the world a organization called celestial being who publicly state that their goal is to stop armed conflict through armed intervention and this might seem contradictory but i hope you learned from our channel that revolution is not a dinner party it's where one class overthrows another class and that's like one of the most violent acts so Celestia being is kind of a vanguard party, like this is this is Lennon's plan here in this Gundam universe. If only we had Gundams, unfortunately we're going to have to, you know, follow more boring methods. But if we could give that up Gundams, you know, I'd say this is a great plan. So this organization of professional revolutionaries is is great, and all the main characters in this group are fascinating. And they're all mysterious at first, like we don't know who any of them are. They keep their like history confidential to each one of them, so no one even knows who each other are. They just trust each other as like comrades, and they all have the same goal of just ending conflict. They're all there because, you know, conflict just like damaged them. Such an FSA, like I already established, was a child terrorist, and obviously he was not okay with that. That's a uh, pretty bad. And at least for this non-spoiler part, I will not talk about anyone else's backstory. But like, when they get revealed, you're like, oh damn, yeah, I can see why you're fighting this now. So the first half of the first season is just insane because there's nothing that can stop the Gundams. Like, it is kind of a power fantasy at this point, you know? <laughs> like, this organization has the potential to intervene in any conflict, just stop anything. 
So the initial conflict is kind of, you know, it's obvious that they're going to win, but what's fascinating is how other countries respond to this. Like, there are just backroom dealings, and this is just a lot of, like, geopolitics going on. They try to, like, stop a state-sponsored ethnic conflict at one point, destroy, like, private mercenary groups, and slowly all the world's nations come together, and they're like, okay, um, we kind of hate this uh, celestial being. They're kind of disrupting our control. So in classic Gundam fashion, there are, like, three economic blocks in this world, and they're basically all bad. Like, they might have a few different ideologies, but they're willing to put them all away to stop Celestial Being. So if you haven't seen any Gundams, I highly recommend this one, and you can just like watch it. This doesn't have any continuity with other Gundams or anything. It's not even really canon, and it's set in a world closest to ours, so this is a pretty good introduction. And it gets right into what makes Gundam great, which is like this political stuff. The character development actually comes later in this show. Like, we don't really get that much of it in these first episodes. It's just immediate conflict, immediate like geopolitical battles basically by politicians who all have all theory motives. I won't say this show's perfect though, so in this review, there are some flaws and I'd say it mostly comes from it actually introduces too many different factions and there are too many people like opposed to a celestial being in their own like unique ways. And it's really cool and nuanced, but some of the characters that like represent these disagreements don't have any depth. Like, it feels like they might have something, but they don't get enough screen time, or they just feel completely wasted. And that's kind of my problem. There's just so many characters. Some of them are just very artificially created. And there's nuance to it. As I read the Wikipedia page, I appreciate it more. But some of the reveals in this series are just kind of cheesy and stupid. And I enjoyed the show a lot more in like these first few episodes, where everything was more simple. So the reason I just like watched this show recently, like I never caught it until now, and I was really sleeping on it. It's because I was checking out the profile of the director Seiji Mishishima, who also directed Concrete Revolutio, uh, the show called Ungo, and Full Metal, the original Full Metal Alchemist. So this guy is insanely good, and I definitely think from all these works, which are extremely leftist, that he must be a comrade. But like, he gets it. Like, he directed it, the original FMA, which obviously had that Ishbalan conflict, and I feel like this show handles it even better, like the Middle Eastern conflict. Because instead of being like a fantasy setting that merely mirrors a Middle Eastern conflict, it shows actual imperialism at work. And later in the show, there is like a basically national liberation front. Or maybe it's like an international liberation front, honestly. I think that's what it is. Okay, but now I'm just going to spoil everything. I think I've gotten enough. I, I think I've convinced you that this show is just amazing. So now into the spoilers. Episode 10 is where things really start heating up, and to be honest, up until this point, I didn't really have any attachment to most of the main characters, because they're so secretive. And this is when the backstory of all the main cast get really revealed, and I'm not kidding you, every single one of them like burst into tears, like the entire celestial being is like crying, they're sobbing, they're, they're completely cornered, they're getting like so many losses, and they're actually being like kind of defeated. So, using some superior tactics, the Colonel Smirnov corners Celestial Being. And he's obviously the best military general of this entire show, really. Or at least the coolest. He's part of the Human Reform League, which is one of the economic blocks. And they're just using all their budget on this operation here. Like, they, this is the only time Celestial Being is really, like, caught by surprise. And the realisticness of Celestial Being is really put into question here. Up until this point, there's been almost no tension. There's only been a few mishaps. That's mostly because Setsuna FSA is really dense. I mean, he's one of the densest protagonists in all of Gundam. So in this episode called Gundam Capture, well, obviously a Gundam is going to be captured. All the Yulia gets cornered, captured, and yeah, it's intense. This is the first time actual mission is compromised. Tiria, who has been a character all ego up until this point, so far he's been like the most dogmatic character of this is how we need to operate as Celestial Being, and he's been criticizing Setsuna for being dense and being stupid. His ego is completely put to the test here. Uh, in the process of trying to free Alleluia, who was already captured, Tiri himself gets like Chains of Heaven, like <laughs> they're, they're using Chains of Heaven in space on Tiri's Gundam. And we get a big Gundam reveal that his Gundam actually has multiple forms, so I think he has the best Gundam model by far, like he has more progressions and transformations as the story goes on. Which unlike the Gundam Double O, which progressively gets upgraded, this just has different forms. So it's just dope. He reveals Nadale to get out of this Chains of Heaven. Really cool, unfortunately. Uh, 
according to the plan and this was not supposed to be revealed yet so everything's going haywire the quantum computer veda which they were using did not predict any of this and by the end of this we see that Alleluia has a split personality called Alleluia which is a psychopathic murderer um, and that's because he was trained as a child soldier by experiments so you know there's some interesting things going on here um this show talks a lot about contradiction maybe all they do is more like a typical notion of hegelian dialectics where his is more personal where he has a split personality so you could see some dialectics at play there but obviously this director is based so we have a marxist understanding of dialectics too so it's not just that he has this split personality but later in the show he has to like in the next few episodes, he has a conflict with, oh, these uh, children who are being experimented on to become soldiers, I need to stop this. So he engages it with, in a material fashion, this contradiction he has in his heart. And it's definitely not easy for him. In this, like, two couple of episodes, this character who, like, why should I care about him? Um, he's really cool. Celestio so Bing also has a tactician, which lays out all their plans. And I think her character design speaks for herself, but she's she's really good, but she doubts almost every decision she makes, unfortunately. And she may or may not be a complete drunk <laughs> when she fails. She's obviously in tears. Uh, Log on Stratos, I forget what happens to him exactly, but um, I'm sure he was not okay with what happened there. And uh, Setsuna say he also failed. So we are at our tensest moment yet in this entire series, and where does it go from there? Actually, it... Uh, Unfortunately, I feel like all the tension kind of stops at this point for at least this first season because they kind of escape there. They get all the Lua back. But then we go into another conflict where all the economic blocks decide to have a joint military operation. This is when they start really cooperating and throwing all the entire world's armies at Celestial Bing at like one time and just like one sequence of episodes. Yeah, it softened the tension. It wasn't a great episode with all the tactics that was in episode 10. Um, it's kind of reversed back here. Um, they just throw waves and waves of their Gundams at Celestial Being, try to divide them, try to eliminate them, and make some captures. But it's just not as cool. They don't even succeed. So I don't really like this part, but the Gundam team only survives that battle because a new group shows up called Trinity. And wow, these guys are dumb. I hate them. I hate I hate Trinity. Oh my god. Trinity have like these fake Gundam models. And let's just say they're basically social chauvinist. See, up until this point, we thought Iolia Shenberg had like this perfect um, plan and Celestial Being was carrying out the only interpretation. But in fact, there are revisionists. Um, <laughs> there are people who think, oh, um, oh, let's just use this as an opportunity to take world domination with these Gundams. And Trinity are, well, they're pretty ultra left. I, I thought like as soon as they were introduced, they seemed cool, but no, no, <laughs> no, they aren't. So skipping ahead a bit, like Trinity is under the control of this guy called Ribbons Almark, who is an innovator, which is different from humanity. And that uh, these innovators have my favorite Gundam thing, which they can telepathically communicate and I, I love this. I, I love in the mobile suit original Gundam, like the new types were able to like telepathically communicate. So as this gets more involved in the plot, I'm really enjoying it because, you know, one-on-one -on -one Gundam battles are one thing. They're fine. But this ability for the Gundam pilots like to surpass the, the boundaries of communication allow for more results than just a one-on-one -on -one death fight, which was getting kind of contrived at this point. Um, like I'm saying, the tension's kind of reduced here. Like, obviously, Celestial Being is going to win, um, but this changes up. Like, how are they going to win? Do they have better arguments? Are they able to telepathically communicate their ideas and reach some other form of understanding? Throughout Double Gundam O, we have like this consciousness in its embryonic form evolving. So these innovators were meant to like help carry out Iolia Shenberg's plan because his plan's really big. <laughs> Um, he is planning for dialogues in space, so I guess he predicted the alien invasion that's going to happen in the movie. And they're going to need these powers to communicate and reach a peaceful understanding with the aliens. Like, how are they supposed to do that? They don't even have a united Earth. But Almark, uh, yeah, he's an opportunist. He takes over, and he, uh, you know, he's all in it for world domination for himself. 
for the first season there's like this guy uh who's like a un united nations guy and he's kind of just there and there's no real depth to his character he's just evil and luckily he gets killed off immediately at the end of the season but yeah this is all kind of frustrating when this gets revealed because while this is creating a more interesting conflict than just easy targets like they had in the beginning these innovators literally just start distributing to the other economic blocks like the drives that they need to make their own gundams so they're now on like a more even playing field with celestial being and it just makes me so angry like in real life like how lenin would be mad at all the revisions and opportunists it's like what are they doing all these people appear that suddenly are like oh this is the true purpose of celestial being i know it exactly how to get to the revolutionary moment we want through all the wrong methods and it's all for their own benefit they're all doing this as opportunists and it's at this point where i recommend you read lenin's what is to be done and i'm going to make some direct comparisons i think it's important because all the problems that lenin pointed out back then of opportunists are relevant to reality right now at this moment all the problems still persist today and in this show which is set in the future and unless we deal with these opportunists i'm sure it will continue i'll put in the description a link to the podcast rev left radio on their episode of what is to be done it's a good listen so basically there's another character and he's kind of mysterious he's not he doesn't really get any lines or anything but he's just implied to be funding celestial being up until this point He's like a bourgeois monopoly guy called Laguna or something. And he's been funding Celestial Being secretly. But it's clear here that that guy was kind of doing this for his own economic gain. Uh, and what is to be done, Lenin critiques the economists who think that the movement should be carried out entirely by like trade unionists. And that the economic struggle itself is like the political act. As if there's no need for a vanguard party to like combine all the struggles which are necessary. You can't just do it through economy only, which is obviously what this Laguna guy who's bourgeois would like to do. Because he has no interest in an actual revolution, he just wants, you know, to get a bit further ahead himself. And a quote-unquote revolutionary movement based on only trade unions is obviously kind of bourgeois. It does not include any other strata of classes or anyone else struggling or anything. Then there's also Trinity who are, you know, the ultra-left. At one point, they even like consider civilians their target. And that's just because Nina's just crazy um, for no reason. <laughs> There's no reason she carries out this attack against civilians, but she just does. And what's important here is by carrying out that one attack, she kills like the family of this one character who I'm going to get into. But the point here is that that completely distanced themselves from the masses. Like the, this is a terrorist act. Terror is not something any leftist should advocate for because it's just terror it's not targeting military or strategical like targets like celestial being has been doing up until this point it's just literally targeting civilians which is there's nothing to gain from terror and what do these economists have in common with these uh terrorists and trinity it's that they're subservient to spontaneity they don't have any goals to lead the revolutionary movement to include all the masses or get anywhere in fact and next to the character nana i'm being equally terrible is Wong the Omei, and, well, she seemed really cool at first, like she was funding Celestial Being, but she's a bourgeois, head of the family. But as soon as Team Trinity shows up, she begins playing both sides. She has kind of one of the weirdest goals in the series, which, she just wants to destroy the world. Uh, at one point she says she wouldn't mind if the world was smashed into pieces. So she just wants a revolution for the violent change that would come from it. It's not really clear why she wants that, I guess she just doesn't want the family name and responsibility that comes with it since it's kind of implied that she's like the last of her family but yeah she's kind of a trot maybe um, because she's playing both sides she's like a double agent and is collaborating with Rubens Almark who is a fascist so you know sounds a lot like Trotsky um, collaborating with Japan and Nazi Germany while advocating for a permanent revolution no matter what the sacrifice may be the way the show makes a statement on how both of these approaches are complete failures is through one particular character who represents just like a normal person, and that person is Saji Crossroad. And I think his name might be a pun just because, you know, Crossroad. Like, how are you going to make the connection with the regular people? And in the first season, he is just a normal person. Um, they, there are scenes with him and his girlfriend, Luis, and they're just having like a mundane life. 
in the middle of Gundam battles. So yeah, he has no real consciousness at all, but through a series of tragic events, the most tragic events in the entire series, he begins to awaken it very slowly, but eventually. To the point where later in the series he says we need to think about the world if we're really after true peace, after spending most of the entire show not thinking at all. But yeah, he was forced in this situation because, well, uh, his girlfriend Luis, like I said, ended up in the hospital with a completely dead family after Nina went insane and blew up like a wedding ceremony. Uh, why? Don't know. And then also his sister who was investigating Laguna at that time in relation to her Iolia Schenberg investigation was just randomly picked off by Ollie Sanchez. So while there was this misunderstanding Saji Crossroad had with Celestio Bing at first, it's clear that Celestio Bing's tactics are designed to not cause this confusion. This was just, you know, a coincidence. Because all their targets up until this point and later down in the second season are all to specifically expose autocracy. So I'll read a quote from Lennon because I feel like this is, you know, the goals that Celestio Bing is operating on. The question arises, what should political education consist in? Can it be confined to the propaganda of working class hostility to the autocracy? Of course not. It is not enough to explain to the workers that they are politically oppressed. Agitation must be conducted with regard to every concrete example of this oppression. Inasmuch as this oppression affects the most diverse classes of society, inasmuch as it manifests itself in the most varied spheres of life and activity, vocational, civic, personal, family, religious, scientific, etc, etc. Is it not evident that we shall not be fulfilling our task of developing the political consciousness of the workers if we do not undertake the organization of the political exposure of the autocracy in all its aspects? In order to carry on agitation around concrete instances of oppression, these instances must be exposed. And as you can see, that kind of contrasts with Team Trinity's approach, which only cared about exposing, like, oh, we can blow up military bases too, look how powerful we are. There was no real connection with the masses they had there, it was straight up adventurism. I'm not gonna say Celestial Bing is perfect per se, I mean, we don't really see any actual agitation. It's implied that there's other people doing agitation and making propaganda for Celestial Being, but it's also heavily censored because there is a media element and like I pointed out, journalists who was sisters with Saji Crossroads was just murdered. So just to recap all what happened in the first season, Ribbon's all mark was manipulating Celestial Being from behind the scenes and was merely using it to unify basically the world under the Earth Sphere Federation, which is becomes like an army, kind of like an extension of like the United Peacekeeping Forces. And this comes about by all the three economic blocks like just coming to a mutual understanding that they just want to take out Celestial Being. And with this unification, it also creates a the AVALs, which are Autonomous Peacekeeping Force, and they're subservient to no one. Like, their name just sounds bad, and they don't operate under any, like, international law or anything. Like, they'll just use drones to kill people, automatic drones to mow people down. Hmm, I wonder what political statements are being made here. So the normal ESF army is kind of just like the more bureaucratic army that actually follows regulations, and it's all for show. The parliamentary nature of this new organization, countries in the Federation have choice, it's all for show because the A-Laws is a completely oppressive force. And to read what the Wikipedia page says about it, this ESF created strict economic policies, media suppression, proxy wars, technology suppression, and all attempts to financially cripple resisting nations and forcing them to have to join the Federation. And there are only a few countries that are even resisting this. Most of them have been forced to join the Federation at gunpoint. So up until this point, Celestio Bing was really like, oh, we are above ideology. And they even say that too when they meet the anti-federation rebels called Catherine. But since they begin allying with these rebels, like, they're clearly not above ideology. They could kind of use that excuse in the first season where they didn't care which country was having armed warfare, they would just intervene and stop it no matter what. But here in the second season, this world government using this A-Laws that is in a completely impressive force, it's clear that Celestio Bing is directly opposing them. And the A-Laws really are just like the perfect example of imperialism so far. From what I can tell, they literally forced every Middle Eastern country to join the Federation. And there was this one country called the Kingdom of Sali that resisted joining the Federation, which is because their economy wasn't crippled by not having solar energy. Apparently they had like metal or something, so they had a bit more stability than the countries that relied on oil, which is useless in this world. 
So it's resisting, it's trying to maintain its independence, and it's even uh, having discussions with the anti-federation rebels, the Catherine. And well, that's not allowed in this world. Determining a country's own path is not allowed in this world. No such thing. I mean, just think about like the five eyes in this world and how any country stepping out of line, Iran, Venezuela, any one of those countries, well, we're just going to tank your economy by sanctioning your oil and stuff like that. You know, it happens. But it goes even more literal in the second season because the Alos make a giant beam called the Memento Mori. And, well, that's a real reminder of death. That will happen when you rebel against the economic world order. And this is really interesting. Let's look into the funding of how this Memento Mori was made. <laughs> the project was information supplied by Ribbons on how to make this satellite beam. So Ribbons Almark is interested in making this because, you know, he wanted to unify his government so he could rule the world. It's funded by the double agent Wang Liu Mei, and it's constructed by the Federation itself. So they don't really hesitate, and they just use this beam immediately after being built on the Kingdom of Sali and destroyed, completely wiped off the face of the Earth. And using their tactics of media suppression because, you know, Ribbons Almark, clever guy, he took over Veda, and the quantum computer is now being used to suppress all media. And that becomes more relevant later on when the ESF military even says they have enough of this A-Law's force and have a coup. Well, their just reasons for having that coup are completely manipulated by the media. So yeah, it becomes clear that a revolution is the only way to stop this because A-Law is really out of control at this point. Luckily though, the A-Laws are, you know, they shoot themselves in the foot to the point where no one trusts them. This one general goes rogue, for example. And it's because they're just completely firing this memento mori beam. And using Death Stars is not okay, so there you go. So just speed running through the end, because there's not much else to say, just a lot of mech fights, is that they defeat A-Laws and then that real enemy becomes Ribbon's Almark, and they have an epic battle with that fascist guy. Really cool. And what is the result? Well, the Earth Sphere Federation completely changes after like the defeat of Ribbon's Almark. The nations that were forced to join regain their independence. It doesn't disband itself, so it's still a thing. But there's presumably less military and just more win-win cooperation. Another fascinating aspect is Veda, which had been used as an impressive tool up until this point, is now a quantum computer being used to centrally plan, I I'd assume, at least. Which hopefully in the future, no. We won't have to plan by paper as the USSR did, central planning. That's kind of inefficient. We'll just use quantum computers like Veda. That sounds pretty good. So there aren't many details on what happens to this ESF. It's assumed to be peaceful. It's assumed to have like expunged all the bad elements of the A-Laws. But just in case, uh, Celestial Being stays an organization. They're hidden now because they don't really have any role at this point. But Setsuna FCA says they'll live on as a deterrent force, even if they have to use military power to do it. Acknowledging that, you know, that's kind of a contradiction, but whatever. But yeah, I love this ending so far because Iron-Blooded Orphans, you know what happened there. It was like a Icarus plot line. They got too close to the sun and burned up. But it would have been so cool if it just had a happy ending or anything. But instead, like, the only happiness we get is through the slight reforms. Like, it was really stupid. At least here, like, they are- it is kind of reforms. It wasn't like a full-on revolution. But Celestial being still intact. And the world seems to be at least going in a good direction. And like I said, you could even imply that they're centrally planning on a socialist basis. Though that's not necessarily certain. And yeah, there's a movie that follows this up, which has an alien invasion. And that just gets more into the themes of understanding that uh, this show has been building up. Because, you know, dialogues of space. How would they use their new telepathic powers to communicate with aliens and reach a mutual understanding? Apparently there's been like a tease for a... Another season of Gundam 00. I don't know if it'll ever be made, but if it does, I'll be back here to talk about this show. So yeah, this is going to be my personal favorite Gundam for a while. I have a hard time believing any other Gundams will replace it as that favorite. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed like this loose podcast format. I really wanted to make like a full-fledged video, but if I were to do that to cover all the details, uh, and besides just this outline I made, it'd probably take like two hours on top of editing it and like I don't think there's going to be enough interest in this video but if there is you know I'll consider it this is a great Gundam show and if it ever gets that other season then I'll really consider it let me know in the comments your thoughts or like anything I didn't cover like there's so many side characters and plots I didn't cover or if you want to give me more recommendations I don't know which Gundam to watch next whether it be Gundam Wing or like Gundam Seed for the memes 
If you want to help support this channel, you can check out Weeb Revolution on Patreon. So with your help, I could make maybe more niche content like this video. Thank you.